Amen and amen and amen. Let's rise up together as we make a declaration of increase in this year of increase. Are you ready? Say with me, I confess today that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. In Him, I have life, His abundant life. The Lord is my light and strength. As He is, so has He made me. By His Spirit, I increase in word and in wisdom, in faith and in favor. The Lord has said, in blessing, I will bless you. In multiplying, I will multiply your seed. So I can boldly say, my God shall increase me more and more. What I place in God's hands grows into overflow. Though I begin small, my end shall greatly increase. In this year of increase, I grow in grace and in strength to be all that God wants me to be. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen and Amen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Let's give the Lord Jesus a mighty clap. We honor you, Lord. We appreciate you and we love you this morning. And please be seated in God's presence. And it's a great joy and an honor to welcome you to this Resurrection Sunday morning service as we remember and commemorate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, last Friday we had a glorious Good Friday service here. I trust that you are here and you are blessed. And uh, today is resurrection. For every Good Friday there is a resurrection. You may go down but God will lift you up in Christ Jesus. And in Him we have life and have life more abundantly. And we trust God that the God of resurrection will also resurrect each one of us in Christ Jesus. Just to remind you that this evening we have a musical concert here. Uh, the music ministry uh, and spirit and all of them have been rehearsing so much to give us uh, uh, just uh, a ministry that will cap our Easter celebration. So we want to encourage all of you to be here this evening. Uh, so you close from church, you go home, take a nap, have your bath, change your clothes, and come back here. And we'll be expecting you for evening service for the concert. It starts at 5.30. You have enough time to eat all the food you can eat and take all the nap you can take and have all the bath you can have and come back here by 5.30. Amen. So please make sure you invite your friends and your loved ones for our evening concert today. Today, uh, as we commemorate uh, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, it's important for us to understand what it is and, and what it means to us. So my message today is titled, The Resurrection Fact and fulfillment the resurrection fact and fulfillment the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundation of the Christian faith his death and his resurrection and the early church was very mindful of the resurrection and we will be looking at that today and uh, just to let you know the early church uh, especially at the time the Acts of the Apostles was written and the Epistles were written, did not have a celebration called Easter. They didn't have an annual Easter festival. They had something better. For the early church, they had Easter or Resurrection every Sunday. So every Sunday when they met, remember the Jewish Sabbath was Saturday. But because Jesus rose on 
the first day of the week, which today we call Sunday, the church made it a habit that every Sunday they will worship Jesus Christ. They will go to gather, they will have fellowship together, and, and gradually church service began on a Sunday, resurrecting or, or commemorating the resurrection. So they were having Easter 52 weeks uh, in a year, uh, almost every week. Uh, they had an Easter service. Of course, later on, the church, because they acknowledged that Jesus Christ died around the day of the Passover, also included the Easter celebration which occurs during the time of Passover. So now we have uh, both Sunday, which commemorates the resurrection. So every time we come to church on Sunday, it's Resurrection Sunday. And then we also have the historical one that occurred around Passover, which is the Resurrection Sunday we call Easter now. So we're going to look at the resurrection, and I'm going to make a case that the resurrection is a fact, and that the resurrection is also a fulfillment. So let's start with some definitions. So what I'm, do I mean by a fact? When we say the resurrection is a fact, what do we mean? It means something that is known and proven to be true. Something that is known and proven to be true. The early Christians knew that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was real because Christ proved it to them. And so for them, the resurrection was not an allegory, it was not a metaphor, it was not a figure of speech, it was factual, it was actual, and it was real. The resurrection was a fact. What do I mean by fulfillment? By fulfillment, I mean the achievement of something that is desired or promised. The early church also saw the resurrection as... The fulfillment of a promise that God had made in the Old Testament. And so we're going to use these two uh, foundations for my message today. And our text for today is in Acts of the Apostles chapter 13. And I'll be reading from verse 28 to 32. And I'm going to give you a background to the text before I read it. Now if you know your Bible well, and I suppose you should... In Acts chapter 13 from verse 1, the Apostle Paul uh, was commended by the Christians in Antioch. He and Barnabas were sent out as missionaries to go and preach the gospel. So the Apostle Paul started to go and preach the gospel. And uh, the passage we are about to read is the first recorded message of Paul in the New Testament. So it's important uh, in terms of the content of what he was preaching. Now you have to understand that Paul the Apostle was not present when Jesus was ministering. He was not a disciple of Jesus Christ. We don't know whether he ever saw him or ever heard him. But Paul uh, didn't know Jesus physically. He wasn't like Peter and James and John and, and, and the rest. Paul heard of Jesus later. And at the time that this account is taking place in Acts chapter 13, Paul has been a Christian for 13 years. 13 years. And so the things he says are quite recent in his time or in his life. And it tells us that the sort of message that the early church was preaching. This message was preached in Antioch of Pisidia. Because when Paul left Antioch, he went round through Jerusalem, came to Perga, and now is in Antioch of Pisidia. And he's meeting with the Jewish leaders, and this is the message he preached to them. Acts chapter 12, 13, verse 28 to 32. So this is part of the message, not the entirety. And though they found no cause for death in him, he's talking about Jesus, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from a tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. 
He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. As I said, Paul is preaching this 13 years after the resurrection. Paul became a Christian three years after Jesus Christ had resurrected. Three years. And that is when Stephen was stoned and, and eventually led to the conversion of, of Paul. So three years after Jesus has resurrected, he became born again. He became a Christian. This is 10 years after his salvation. That is, so in total, it's 13 years. So if, for example, Paul was speaking in 2022, at this time in this year, the events he's talking about happened in 2019, uh, 2009, 2009. That is 30 years ago. Now, if I come here and I start talking about something that happened 2009, and all of you were around in 2009, you can tell whether I am lying or I'm telling the truth. Is that not so? So this is not far away from the event. Paul cannot come and manufacture information. So he's speaking in, in terms of a recent history that has happened to the church. And if you listen to his account, he says there are witnesses here. There are people still alive who saw all the things I'm talking about. And he talked about the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he talked about the evidence that was there, that is the people. And then he says that all that happened was in fulfillment of what God said in the Old Testament. So that is where we proceed from here. There are three main facts that Paul stated. Three main facts. The first one is that Jesus really died. Jesus really died. It may seem like a very simple statement when we say Jesus really died because... Of course, now people say, well, Jesus died. But, you know, many times we say things without thinking through what we are saying. And without fully even believing what we are saying. That Jesus really died. He didn't enter into a coma. He didn't go through a, snoo, a, a swoon. Jesus really died. The guy died. How do we know? Well, John's gospel tells us that Jesus died. All the gospels say, but I like John. John chapter 19, verse 30 to 34. Now, why am I quoting John? Because if you note, John and Jesus' mother, Mary, were the only one of Jesus' followers who are physically present at the crucifixion. Peter is not there. James is not there. The rest have run away. John is there. So John's record is very important because he, he's watching what is going on and listening to the conversation. And listen to what John says. John chapter 19 verse 30 to 34. So when Jesus had, re had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. That's how John describes the death of Jesus. He gave up his spirit. And then from verse 33. But when they had come to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And immediately blood and water came out. Now, the witness of John is multi-layered. Why do I say it's multi-layered? He didn't just say, Jesus died. How? He gave up his spirit. That's only one layer. John says Jesus gave up his spirit. But what is the other evidence that Jesus died? Well, you know, crucifixion in the days of Jesus uh, was uh, a many day event. So when you were crucified, you didn't die immediately. So people hung on the cross for three days, sometimes six days, sometimes one week. So when the soldiers hang you and they have to take you down from the cross, 
they have to ensure that you will not run away so that the next day they can come and put you back on the cross and you continue your suffering. So when Jesus was on the cross, John says he gave up his spirit. That's John's testimony. The soldiers came and they had to determine whether these guys on the cross have to be incapacitated so that they will not run away the next uh, for, ne- for the next day's crucifixion. And when they came to Jesus Christ, they certified that he's dead. So John says, Jesus is dead. The soldiers are also saying Jesus is dead. Two layers. They didn't have a stethoscope or pulse reader at that time. I don't think they certified death the way we certify dead, whether it's brain dead or clinically dead. So their way of certification of dead is to make sure you are dead properly. So a soldier took a spear and pierced his heart. So if the crucifixion didn't kill him, he's given up the spirit, he didn't kill him. Observation didn't kill him, definitely the spear will kill him. Three layers of death. That is the testimony of John. And John is saying, we know without any shadow of doubt that Jesus really died. How do I know? I was there. He said, Father, I give my spirit up. Secondly, the soldier said he was dead. And another soldier made it without any doubt that he was dead. It's so important because there are people who debate the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. But according to John, Jesus died definitely without any apology. It's like going to find somebody who is dead and shooting him in the head to ensure that he's dead. So that's what happened with Jesus. He was dead, dead. The second fact is, is that Jesus was really buried. He was really buried. Why is that important? Because burial is an acknowledgement of the people that you are dead. You don't bury people when you think they will come back to life. You bury people when you are sure this is the end of the case. Jesus was really buried. Matthew chapter 24, 27. 57 to 56, you can read all of it. But I will read verse 59. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb, and departed. That's one level. Verse 56, 50, 65. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go your way, make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Layers of burial. We have layers of death, multi layered burial. What happened with the burial of Jesus? Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and says, Please give me the body of Jesus, I'm his follower. Joseph of Arimathea is a popular guy with Pilate. Pilate says, okay, take his body. He takes his body down, takes him to his tomb, buries him in his tomb. Now you have to understand, the tomb of Joseph was very close to Calvary where Jesus was crucified. So if Jesus was crucified somewhere up there at the end of the auditorium, the burial place is somewhere here. So it's not like they were going to Awudome looking for a cemetery. The cemetery was just there. The tomb was just around the place of crucifixion. So conveniently, they took him out there and put him here. And one of it was because it was preparation for the Passover feast and for the, for the Sabbath. So they had to do it quickly. Now, after Jesus had been buried by Joseph, the Jewish leaders went to Pilate and said, Sir, trouble is coming because this guy said whilst he was alive that he will rise again we have to ensure he doesn't rise again so although he's dead and he's buried we can't end it there we have to secure the burial so Pilate says oh okay go ahead and secure the burial so they went ahead they secured the burial uh, the, the stone 
they seal the stone and they put a guard at the burial ground. Three or four layers of burial. They have to make sure the guy is buried. Nothing is going to bring him out. And when the Bible talks about a guard, it's not one person. A temple guard or a Roman guard was between 20 to 50 people. So that's a lot of people. A guard is like a detachment, a platoon. A guard means between 20 to 50 people. Watching a dead man in a tomb with the tomb sealed and covered. Something strange is going on. Jesus truly died. Jesus was truly buried. The third one, Jesus really rose from the dead. Jesus really rose from the dead. He was really dead. Really buried. Really resurrected. Now how do we know that Jesus resurrected? Jesus did that in many ways. John chapter 20, verse 24 to 28. Or 29. You can read all of it, but I'll read portions of it. When Jesus died, he rose again. And the women came to report. Some of them said, Jesus is alive. How do you know? The grave is empty. Oh, the grave is empty and so what? Then Peter and John went. Jesus is not in the grave. But they didn't see Jesus. Then Mary came and said, I saw him. He looked like a god now. You women, you can trust them. Because you have to understand the resurrection was not easy to believe. Just like you and I, it's not easy for us to remember, uh, to, to accept that somebody is resurrected. I mean, all of us took somebody to the cemetery, put him six feet down, covered it, put a tombstone on it, and then somebody came and said, uh, the guy is walking there. I mean, that, that's not the kind of thing you go ahead and say, oh yeah, I believe so. No. These people were reasonable people like you and I. They weren't about to just believe that Jesus is alive. Jesus alive was the most difficult thing for them to believe. That's where the Bible says that consistently they all denied it. Peter denied it. John denied it. Everybody denied it. Then that evening, whilst they were debating the denial because by this time it's Sunday evening resurrection morning the women have come some said they saw him others said they didn't see him Peter went to the grave there was nobody there and then two men from Emmaus they were walking in the night and they came and said guess what happened Jesus was walking with us to our village and he talked to us and we are back to tell you he's alive he said, oh, that can be true that can be true that can be true then whilst they are debating, can it be true? Then Jesus appears in the middle of them. They say, oh, this is getting serious. This is him. This is Jesus. Their senses are shocked. But there is one disciple of Jesus, like you and I, who was not there. His name is Thomas. And he was told, Thomas... Jesus appeared. And Thomas responded the way you and I will respond. Are you guys crazy? Yeah, we believed him. We saw he's a miracle worker. But are you crazy? Please don't take this thing too far. Don't disgrace yourselves. So listen to Thomas's statement. Verse 25. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. He said to them, Unless I see his in his hands the print of the nails... And put my finger into the print of the nails. And put my hand into his side. I will not believe. I like this guy. He's a bit like me. I will not, I will not believe. Thomas says I won't believe. So next time. The week. Next week. Next week Sunday. Same condition. They are shut in. Jesus appears. Verse 27. And then he says to Thomas. Read your finger here. And look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it in my side. 
do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Thomas was the first person to call Jesus God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So, the scripture doesn't tell us whether Thomas really put his finger in there. But he saw Jesus. And he, his mind was blown to pieces. The way your mind will be blown to pieces if you saw something like that. He said, my Lord and my God what is this what am I seeing how is it possible and Jesus says to Thomas you are believing because you have seen but blessed are those who do not see but have believed why did Jesus say that Thomas was able to believe that Jesus was dead but he couldn't believe that Jesus was alive. The first question you have to ask yourself, Mr. Thomas, how did you know Jesus was dead? He was not at Calvary. He didn't go there. Only John and Mary were there. So, he was not at the burial. Joseph of Arimathea and probably Mary and others and some of the women were there. Thomas was not there. How did he know Jesus was dead? He knew Jesus was dead because he was told Jesus was dead. People came and said, listen, we were there. They put nails in his hand. That's how he knew there was nails in his hands. And they said, listen. And once the soldier pierced his side with a sword. That's how Thomas knew that somebody had pierced the side of Jesus with a sword, uh, with a spear. He was not there. He didn't see it. But he believed it. Why? Because he believed those who gave the testimony that Jesus had been crucified and Jesus had been speared. So the problem is, if you believe the death because some people told you, why do you find it difficult to believe the resurrection when the same people tell you? Because Thomas has selective belief. He's like many people. They want, they want to choose what they want to believe. There are people who tell you, Jesus died. And then he didn't die. And his, his, his disciples took him uh, uh, to India. And he lived for the rest of his life in India. Well, in the first place, how do you know Jesus died? Ah, it's in the Bible. Well, if you believe the Bible said Jesus died, then how can't you believe that he, the same Bible says he's alive? You can't choose which truth you want to believe and which truth you will not believe. If you will believe the witnesses of those who say he's dead, you must believe the witnesses of those who say he's alive. That's just simple logic. And that is the problem Jesus had with Thomas. You believed them when they said, I'm dead, but you didn't believe when they said, I'm alive. And part of the reason Jesus told Thomas that was because Thomas is like us. We are people who believe Jesus without seeing the print in his hands and without seeing the print in his side. We are like Thomas. And Jesus said, it is more blessed to believe without seeing than to believe with physical evidence. So Jesus is saying to Thomas, there are many people coming after you. They will not be here to see me. And I have to show you the better way of believing is not look for physical evidence, but to trust the witnesses who declared the fact to you. That is the better way. It is said that this same Thomas, according to church history, believed after Jesus Christ went far away to India to preach the gospel. And he preached the gospel and died. He was martyred for his belief. And he never changed his opinion that Jesus was alive. Why? Because the evidence he saw that evening in that room 
was complete and absolute without any shadow of doubt. You know, there are people who say, you Christians, you just believe anything. As if they are superior people. You know, how many of you believe there was a guy called Nelson Mandela? How many of you believe Mandela is dead? Did you ever meet Mandela? Did you shake his hand? Did you see his dead body? How do you know he's dead? Somebody told you. And the person who told you was sitting in a studio. He didn't see Mandela dead, didn't touch his body, but he sat and said, This is breaking news. Nelson Mandela, the apartheid icon, has passed away. In a studio in Atlanta. And you in Ghana believe Mandela is there. How do you know? Because somebody told you. How, how, how do you know there is a war going on in Ukraine? Have you been to Ukraine? Have you been to Russia? Do you know Vladimir Putin? Do you know Putin's father? Have you shaken Putin's hand? But you believe he's waged a war against Ukraine? And you're on Facebook insulting him? How do you know? Somebody in the studio told you. And the person didn't stick his life on it. He just read on a teleprompter. And you believed it. The people who wrote this book, they didn't read from a teleprompter. They died for what they believed in. They were beheaded. They were burnt alive. They were cut into pieces. Their children were murdered in front of them. Women had children plucked out of their stomachs. And none of them changed the story. We saw it. We know it. He died. He rose again. We saw it. We know it. He died. He rose again. He is truly who he says he is. I don't know about you. Between the man in the studio telling me about a war I have never seen and telling me about people I have never seen and the people who shed their blood to say my blood is the evidence that I believe in what I am saying. If you ask me whom I am supposed to believe, I will believe these guys. I believe these guys. Between the one who tells me that there are galaxies somewhere 10 million light years away have you been there have you traveled one light year ever before do you know what a light year looks like but we believe them and the man who says i saw it and even if you cut my head i will not change my story you kill my wife i won't change my story you kill my children i won't change my story you boil me in oil i won't change my story you, you, you take out my intestines, I won't change my story. You, you skin me alive, I'll still not change my story. Because it was such a compelling force when he showed up to me. Not only that, even the second generation believed so much in the first generation that they believed without seeing. And throughout the history of Christendom, the reason we believe Jesus is alive is because those witnesses were credible witnesses. They died for their witness. And I believe their witness that Jesus died, Jesus was buried, and Jesus rose again. That is the fact. Now let's go to the fulfillment. I'll take a little time today. Don't don't rush me too much. I need to finish my message well. The fulfillment. Luke chapter 24. From verse 48 to 48. Uh, 47 to 44 to 48. Jesus was speaking to the two men at Emmaus. But I will only look at verse 46. And he said to them. Thus it is written. Thus it was necessary. For the Christ to suffer. And to rise from the dead. The same day. Jesus is saying. It was written, it had to happen. It was written, it had to happen. Promise had to be fulfilled. 
God had to do what he said he would do. And what is the fulfillment? The fulfillment is that Jesus is truly the promised Messiah of the scriptures. What Isaiah spoke about, what the Psalms spoke about, what all the other prophets spoke about is true. Jesus is truly the promised Messiah. Secondly, the resurrection also shows that Jesus is who he says he was. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus predicted his death and resurrection to the deep. You see that one of the things I like about the Bible is the gospel writers, they didn't change the story. Because, you know, normally if you were a human being and when Jesus was, al was, was alive, uh, you, you, you did, uh, or, or when Jesus came resurrected, you didn't believe it. And la now you are writing the story. You say, oh, others didn't believe. But as for me, I believed. But none of the gospel writers said that. They actually told us Peter denied him. They told us of those who ran away. They told us of how difficult it was to believe it. They were honest people. Reporting an honest information. That Jesus was who he says he is. And when Jesus spoke about his death and resurrection, he predicted it with accuracy. He said, I'll be betrayed by one of you. I'll be given over. The, 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 the chief priest would take me. They will take me over to the Gentiles. I will be condemned. I will be crucified on a cross. I will die. I will rise again. And do you know any human being who has been able to predict his own end this way? The resurrection proves that Jesus is exactly who he said he was. He's the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And the resurrection also shows us that Jesus achieved what he set out to achieve. He atoned for the sin of the first Adam. He paid the price for the sins of the world. And he's the final sacrifice for the redemption of the human race. But not only is it a fulfillment, the resurrection is also a new promise. Jesus was the fulfillment of an old promise. But his resurrection gives us a new promise. Which will be fulfilled. If the first one was fulfilled, the new promise will be also fulfilled. What is the new promise? The new promise first is that there is life beyond death Jesus came back to tell us the story you know many times we say oh we were nobody has died and come to tell us what it is like well he died and came back and told us behold I am he who was alive and was dead and I'm alive forevermore you want to know what is beyond the grave talk to the man who came from the grave do you know, can you imagine what the world would do if somebody was executed by firing squad, bullets rain into the guy, doctors certify he's dead. Three days later, he's walking the streets of Accra. Everybody will go and talk to him. So, where are you coming from? What is life like? And if the guy, whatever he says, everybody will believe. Whatever he says. If he says, from now onwards, I have to walk on your head. <laughs> we will believe it. <laughs> He's gone and come. Jesus is the only one who is gone and come. You better believe what he says. Because the other people who are contending with him, they went, they never came. But he went and he came. By his own power, he came back. There is life beyond this one. 
The second promise he gives to us is that the life beyond death is real. Look at the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus didn't forget information when he resurrected. He knew Thomas. He called his name. He knew Peter. He knew John. He knew Mary. He remembered people's names. He remembered the names of towns. That means in the resurrection we don't forget information. And that's the promise get called God is given to you. You would know your parents when you meet them. You know your brother when you meet him. So when we say God be with you till we meet again, we are not talking rubbish. Because Jesus showed us that in the resurrection we have memory. We have remembrance. We have knowledge. We have personality. We have individuality. That was his resurrection. Other religions preach a resurrection that is different from this. Some say when, when you die, you become part of nature. You become part of the universe. You are like a drop of water in a big ocean. It's like what you, you, you see in the Lion King, the circle of life. The antelope eats the grass and the lion eats the antelope and then the lion dies and becomes grass and then the antelope eats him. That is absolute rubbish and nonsense. No matter where that theology or philosophy came from. Jesus did not become grass. Our bodies may become but the real man lives on. And it's a conscious recognizing individual. And in the true resurrection, we get a new body like Jesus Christ. And you remember your acquaintances. You live a real life. That is Christianity. In Christianity, we don't become one with the universe. You know, have you noticed these days, people don't want to even call God God. They want to call him the universe. The universe will bless you. What kind of rubbish is that? Saturn, Uranus will come and bless me. I mean, do, what, do people think when they say these things? Which universe? Because my Bible tells me the universe didn't cause itself. In the beginning, God caused the universe. If you don't want to believe the cause, why do you believe his creation? But in the resurrection, our personalities, we have life. We don't just become air. You know, like some of you believe, Ooh, Papa has come. Papa has come. Because the door opened and shut. Papa has come. <laughs> Papa has come. Your grandfather is opening and shutting doors in the house. Is that what Jesus did? He's an invisible man. Thomas, the Peter said, Who? Door open. Who? Shut. Door open. Shut. Where are you? Who is here? Invisible man. No, that's not the Christian resurrection. This Jesus, when he rose up, he came in the midst of them. They saw them. Thomas saw him. He probably touched him. Mary touched him. The disciples touched him. Because he had a glorified body and the promise he gives to you I will give you the same I will give you the same that is the Christian hope that is our hope of resurrection and Jesus says if you believe in him he will give you that life so today we see the resurrection it's a fact it's a fulfillment of an old prophecy but it is the beginning of a new promise. And those who believe in Christ will inherit the new promise. The promise of eternal life. Not in abstract, but in reality. A real eternal life. And this morning, this same Jesus is here to save you. And he's here to give you his life. And he has to turn your life around. He's here to change your life. He's here to make you a brand new person. And if you will believe him. He says where I am. There you will be also. 
So if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, you better know him. You say, Pastor, I'm not even sure what I believe. You better believe Jesus when he says it. Believe the witnesses when they gave their life up for it. So if you are here and you want this life that Jesus has, it is free. He gives it to all freely. And I want everybody to bow down your heads. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens, I will come in. He's knocking at the door of your heart. He can't force himself in. If you open the door, he'll come in. And if you want to open your heart for Jesus to come in, to come into your life and change you, with every head bowed, just lift up your right hand wherever you are. You say, Pastor, I want to start a new journey with Christ. I want Jesus to come into my heart. Lift up your right hand wherever you are. Don't feel shy. Don't feel embarrassed. Keep your hand up, please. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up if you lifted up your hand. I see many of you put up your hands. If you put up your hands, please stand up wherever you are. Just stand up for a minute. Stand up. Just stand up. Stand up. Stand up. God bless you. Those of you who, stand, who are standing, I want you to put your hand on your heart. And we're all going to pray this prayer. I want you to pray it with your heart and make it. Say with me, Heavenly Father, I come to you today just as I am. I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. I ask you, Father, save me. Have mercy on me. Deliver me. I believe Jesus died for me. I believe he rose again from the dead because of me. And I receive him today as my Lord and my Savior. I thank you, Father, for accepting me in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you so much. The ushers will give you a form to fill. Please fill it so that we can get in touch with you and help you to live the Christian life. The Christian life is the best life ever on this earth. There is none close to it. This is the best life. The life of Jesus Christ poured out for us that we may have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. We're going to receive our project's offering. I want you to give generously as the Lord has blessed you. The band will minister as we take our project offering.